Hello and welcome back to the channel. I'm Loudguns and today we're going to take a look at what concept ships are still in the pipeline. I'll be focusing here on ships available to players, so we won't be looking at things like the Bengal or the Vandal King ship in this video, but if you'd like to hear more about those then let me know in the comments and we can take a look in a future episode. Before we dive into it, if you're a new player checking out what the game has to offer in the future and you choose to create an account, just make sure you use a referral code when you sign up. This will get you some extra starting cash and at the time of recording a free armour set. This one's mine, but really just use anybody's. Also, if you're looking for an active group to come and play with, then come and say hi on Discord. The link's in the video description down below. For me, this is more about seeing what vehicles are still to be implemented, and to provide an overview for anyone who's newer to the verse. It's not really about whether or not you should stump up cash for any of these. I'm not stopping anyone from giving CIG their money, it's just not my place to say how you should spend the fruits of your labour. If you are buying into concepts though, I do think it's worth keeping in mind that ships can and will be changed as the game is developed. Uh, there was a lot of recent fallout around a certain size 7 laser cannon strapped to a ship, uh, which I think just highlights how dangerous it can be to part with hundreds of dollars because something is meta. Uh, personally, my approach is to avoid locking in too much in terms of my hangar for now. I keep a lot of options open with CCUs, but I don't commit to anything in particular. I want to see how things turn out and then decide on what my hangar should look like once we've got a lot more information. First up, we've got the Tumble Ranger series of motorbikes. You uh, probably know by now that I love hover bikes, but I personally am really looking forward to life on two wheels. And it's particularly the Ranger CV touring version, uh, built for a bit of rugged exploration that's my thing. Uh, but we also have the RC, which is the racing variant, and the TR combat variant, because if you can strap guns to it, CIG will strap guns to it. Sticking with bikes, but this time going for the hover variety, we have the X1 series from Origin. Again, the variants follow a familiar pattern. You've got the Touring as the base version, uh, the X1 Velocity Racing variant, and the X1 Force Pathfinder variant. And finally, for the ground vehicles, we have the Origin G12s. You'll never guess, uh, but they have Touring, Racing, and Military variants as well. So, on to the spaceships. Uh, to start, we have the first of the Mist Hull series, the Hull A, which is still slated for a 317 release, I believe. Uh, the ship is pitched as a starter cargo runner, which, uh, with its capacity to carry 48 SEU, puts it far in excess of most ships around this price. However, it does lack any of the versatility of the other starters, so you are going to be doing nothing apart from cargo running in this vessel. The Hull A's first bigger brother, the Hull B, is next up. Uh, billed as a competitor to MISC's own Freelancer line, with a cargo capacity of 384 SCU, it far outstrips anything in that particular series. Uh, so the, the Hull B definitely punches above its size for cargo capacity, but as with all of the Hull series, the external nature of its pods is a risk trade-off that would be haulers are going to need to be aware of. Oh, Salvage, where art thou? Well. All we know is that when Salvage does make its way into the PU, the Drake Vulture is likely to be the first iteration of the game loop. Uh, the ship should be the entry level career ship designed to take a single person, quite similar to the Prospector's role in mining. And personally I love Drake's industrial no frills vibe for this type of ship, uh, and some of the latest updates do make it look pretty awesome. This one might be a bit confusing to some since the tally is already in-game, uh, but what we have is the Retaliator Bomber. Uh, so the Retaliator is actually meant to be a modular vessel with options for cargo and personnel transport, as well as the torpedo option that we currently have in the PU. From my beloved Argo and glorious to behold in orange is the SRV. So this is the tugboat of the SC universe with its rear mounted tractor beam designed to tow other ships away, potentially assisting in salvage or repair operations. 
and in some Q&A posts it's been noted that it might be useful to have some of these on hand to assist larger ships in breaking atmosphere. Uh, really interesting that this one's made its way onto the progress tracker, uh, because that's a pretty decent sign that they're working on sort of proper ship mounted tractor beams, uh, as opposed to just sort of a visual. Aegis's entry level repair, refuel and rearm ship, the Vulcan, is up next. This ship is designed for frontline logistical support, with a much smaller profile than some of the larger support ships like the Starfarers or Crucibles. However, you will have to make a choice about what services you're looking to provide. So while it's going to be capable of all of these tasks, you'll have to spec it out to just offer one service at a time. I know this is one that's going to have a lot of folks excited, me included. Uh, the Corsair is Drake's competitor to the RSI Connie. It's Drake, so you're getting a lot less frills and safety features, but it's Drake, so you're getting a lot more guns. I'm really looking forward to this one and I think it might well challenge for the spot of my daily driver. It'll be really interesting to stack this, the Connie, the 400i and the MSR up against each other once we can get behind the sticks of all four. The Santoki Eye is a medium fighter of Xi'an design. With their characteristic thruster tech, it's likely to feel like a beefed up version of the Cartual. The Matrix has it down as sporting four size three weapon hardpoints in a similar fashion to the Aegis Sabre, and a single medium shield. But that being said, the Matrix is somewhat untrustworthy on the concept front, and as we've seen recently, ships aren't sacred even after being added to the verse. The RSI X-Wing, or Scorpius as it's officially known, provides a heavy fighter to compete with the Hurricane in terms of a dual-seater turret show. Both the pilot and the gunner in this ship have control of four size 3 weapons, giving it a total of eight size 3 hardpoints. With the turret sporting a unique rail system, uh, giving it either a forward or rear-facing orientation, rather than the 360 degree turn of other ships. I know a lot of people were asking in the Q&A for this ship whether with AI blades you'll be able to slave the turret to pilot control. Personally I hope that either we won't or that using your blade slot for this sort of slaving will deprive you of an option that could make flying with a friend a better option. The Gatak Raylan is a cargo ship that has slowly grown on me as an idea over time. It's built as a blockade runner which was the original USP of the BMM but that ship's outgrown that purpose. So the Raylan offers a strong amount of turreted firepower and a lot of component redundancy to ensure that it can make it through concessor zones with precious cargo. It's got quite a unique design drawing a lot of Xi'an tech um, and it's got external cargo which is the one thing which makes me slightly uh, confused given its role as a blockade runner. However it remains to be seen whether all external cargo is equal, so maybe these pods for example are sturdier than the type we might find on the whole series for instance. The RSI Apollo comes in two variants, the triage in red and the medevac in white. Uh, the medevac is the version designed for hotter zones with better armour and weaponry, but it sacrifices a bit on top speed. If you don't see an option to buy the pledge for the, uh, the medevac, there's a small game that you can play, uh, which I believe is still buried in the CIG website. I'll see if I can find a link to stick in the video description down below. Other than that, both ships offer top tier medical rescue, with interiors that can be configured to offer different amounts of different tiered medical beds. So you have two bed slots, each of which can house either three tier three beds, two tier two, or one tier one bed. They also have large scanners for aiding in search and rescue operations, and CIG have mentioned medical drones for recovering patients in the Q&A. Ultimately, these should be the versus top tier ambulances or mobile clinics, with the Endeavour providing a space-bound hospital option. Speaking of the Endeavour, here it is. The ship is one that I really can't do justice in a quick run-through like this, but both Info Runners and Star Jump Station have done fantastic deep dives on this ship. The Endeavour is peak modularity, with a base ship that can accommodate a huge variety of modules. 
These include biodomes for growing crops, a hadron collider for upgrading parts, a telescope for finding jump points, and a whole range of other options. I would personally expect that, as with the Retaliator, we might see certain specific variants of the Endeavour, such as the Endeavour Hope Hospital Ship, make it into the verse ahead of the fully modular versions. Just watching John Crew's face whenever someone mentions this ship is a pretty good indication of what a challenge it's going to be. The Crucible is, in my opinion, one of the most underrated ships out there. A lot of folks already have quite sizeable fleets and the number of ships out in the verse is only going to grow as players and orgs get to grinding those credits and spending them in the ship shops. So repair is only going to become more and more important as those fleets have to be maintained. The Crucible houses a detachable bay, the Scarab, that can either be used to house smaller ships like fighters for crews to work on without suits, or leave behind so that it can service larger vessels. Back to the whole series, but on a different scale now, we have the Miskol Sea. It's at this point that the whole series loses the ability to land planet or moon side with cargo, so this is going to be more of a long distance space bound hauler, relying on smaller cargo transports to get that load to its final destination. That being said, for that sacrifice it gains a huge capacity, with the ability to transport 4608 SCU. That's more than 6.5 times the capacity of anything in game at the moment. The whole sea has been knocked back a bit in terms of release, but shouldn't be too far off. I just think before we see this we're going to need to see cargo missions, where a hauler can take a contract to move goods for an NPC organisation, otherwise there's not really going to be any profit in this ship due to its inability to get goods from planet side. One that I'm really interested in is seeing the uh, Crusader Genesis Starliner. I like to quote a friend of mine who said passengers are just cargo that loads and unloads itself and the Genesis offers a high end of bulk transport. I personally think this is going to be a really important ship for orgs. If you need to ensure that a large number of your players make it to a particular location for an event, this may be just the way to do it while their ships are transported separately. I struggle for smart things to say about the Miss Cole series once we get to the D&E. They're like the whole sea but bigger. Quite a lot bigger. The whole D is marked as having a capacity of 20,736 SCU, so now we're up to nearly 30 C2 Hercs. A really interesting side note for the whole D and E from the Q&As though is that they are going to be able to transport small ships within their cargo boxes, as long as they've been dismantled to some degree. I'd imagine that as we progress towards a much larger verse, this will be one of the key ways in which orgs get their smaller craft from point A to point B. The Banu Merchantman potentially wins the most anticipated award, and the latest updates on this ship as it's entered production have whetted a lot of appetites across the community. The capital trade ship of the Banu race boasts 2,800 SCU of internal cargo, affording it far more protection than you can get from a whole series hauler. The Merchantman is really meant more as a floating bazaar with a marketplace allowing players to operate retail shops, and additions such as a negotiation room, a hangar and a med bay leave the ship much better equipped and more versatile. It also boasts significant armament in the form of numerous turrets including two massive size 8s. The RSI Orion will be the endgame ship for a lot of avid miners. Builders being able to give individuals and small orgs the platform to compete with mega mining corps. The Orion won't be visiting any planets or moons due to its bulk, but it's likely to be seen churning through asteroid belts with its array of tractor beams and lasers, as well as a moor designed to crush entire asteroids. The ship also benefits from an onboard refinery, allowing it to process raw ore into more valuable processed metals without stopping. The Liberator from Anvil is a concept that I feel has an image problem. At its root, I believe it could be a very interesting ship. The proposed SC universe is massive and there are going to be distances, even just within single systems, that it's going to be impossible for smaller ships like single-seater fighters to cover. The Liberator provides a much-needed transport option for getting your fleets across these gaps, maybe without the disassembly that transporting them in the whole D or E might entail. 
That being said, I'm not sure why what is essentially a ship ferry seems to be entering a frontline combat zone in every piece of concept art it's featured in. To me, this is the ship that gets your fighters and tanks to a fob before they're taken into the heat of battle by an M2 or under their own gas. I know I said it at the beginning, but it's worth reiterating that I'm not paying any attention in this video to what these ships cost dollar-wise. It's particularly worth saying in the context of the RSI Perseus, because I love everything about this ship, apart from the truly stupid cash price. The Perseus is a gunboat that to me invokes a feeling of the PT cruisers from Vietnam, and it's one I'm probably going to prioritise getting in-game. The ship has two turrets, each equipped with two bespoke size 7 ballistic cannons, and this should make it a perfect ship for targeting other similarly sized corvettes and larger capitals when acting in concert with a fleet. A role I particularly think the Perseus will excel in is forming wolf packs to raid supply lines during a conflict, and this weaponry should make short work of enemy supply and logistics vessels. And unlike in a modern, conventional war, front lines are going to be much harder, if not impossible, to draw in a space conflict. Odyssey controversy might be quite high after one dev labelled it a Carrick killer, but actually I think this highlights a really big important point about Star Citizen. There should be different ways to accomplish a task, there should be a variety of ships, each with strengths and weaknesses, that can give us enough options to have some healthy disagreement about how we approach the challenges of the verse. Personally, I'm Team Carrick, with its more impressive scanning capabilities, but you may favour the Odyssey with its better formatted hangar and impressive turret-mounted weaponry. Its key USP, the ability to mine and refine quantum fuel on the go, has disappointed a lot of folks since it was revealed that it couldn't just refine the quantanium into its metal form. However, from a balanced perspective, this does make sense to me. I know I'm only one small voice in the SC community, but if I could say something directly to CIG, it's that ships, particularly when you're putting $750 price tags on them, should only be made available for sale after the Q&A goes out. I know that I made a number of calls to friends of mine to just hold off and keep their wallets in their pockets, since the ship was made available to buy with far too little ironclad information to make that sort of spending decision. You know, unless of course you just want to flex your crypto gains. The Nautilus from Aegis is a dedicated mine layer. We still have to hear a lot about how mines are going to work in SC. And I for one am interested to know just how big a minefield you would have to lay in order to protect an objective in three-dimensional space. But it could offer orgs a good option for protecting a claim such as a premium mining site. The team at CIG have talked about the Nautilus having the option to lay both Proxim mines, but also sentry turrets, I assume like the ones we see around space stations and during some of the missions in the PU at the moment. The last of the whole series is the Hully. Uh, to be honest at this point, uh, things are maybe getting a little bit silly in terms of size. 98,304 SCU of cargo pasty. I like silly maths, so if you were to fill that up with Quantanium, it would take you 1,024 perfect runs in your mole, and be valued at 865 million and 75,200 credits at current prices. You might want to ensure that against piracy. The RSI Polaris is the largest Corvette class or small capital ship currently listed in concept. To me, this is a great size of ship for a reasonable size org and maybe one that might see an awful lot more actual use than the giants we're about to come on to. Crew is listed as a minimum of 6 and a maximum of 14. Uh, CIG do have a history of these things growing as they realise they have to fit components in etc. But they have been getting better in recent years at releasing better concepted concepts. Uh, the Polaris was brought in to fill a gap left by the Idris after the Idris itself grew too big, uh, so I can see these figures remaining somewhat true. This makes it a perfect size for a reasonably active group to consistently crew, and that's why it's a ship I'm arguably more interested in than some of its bigger cousins. The Polaris sports an array of turrets, but its real punch comes from a complement of size 10 torpedoes that mean it has the teeth to potentially knock out cap ships many times its size. It also has a decent sized hangar capable of taking a fighter like the Sabre or the Scorpius, allowing it to aid in force projection. We dived into the Pioneer quite a lot in the recent land claim video, 
Uh, this is a capital class outpost builder that will really only see its potential realised once building mechanics are fully integrated. However, when we have that in place, this should be the premier method for putting down your bases, effectively representing a flying factory capable of deploying itself into a mobile building site. Now onto the truly massive capital ships of the SC universe. The Aegis Idris is marked as a frigate. Uh, I did some reading and apparently in naval terms, frigate is kind of a shrug emoji that can be applied to wherever it fits at the time. But the Idris comes in three variants. The M military version features a size 10 railgun as well as a host of point defense weapons, which are then removed on the P civilian version to allow for more cargo space. There's also a K, which is an effectively an aftermarket kit for the P, giving it back the point defence turrets and a size 10 mount, this time with a laser beam weapon from Hurston Dynamics. It's been stated that you should be able to, through finding the necessary parts in the verse, retrofit a P or K to have the same firepower as the M. All versions of the Idris can carry two medium fighters in the main hangar, as well as Nargo MPUV in a dedicated bay. This is truly into walk territory, as we're looking at fully crewed complement of 28 people. Admittedly, I see ships like this being part NPC run, but I think with the way SC is going, you're going to be best served having as many people at the post as you possibly can. If you want a true carrier though, look no further than the Drake Kraken. This I would argue is probably the most versatile capital ship in the lineup, with an ability to serve as a platform for not only combat operations but also industrial and support roles. As we mentioned with the Liberator, force projection is going to become a huge issue in SC once we're out into a larger system than Stanton, where your single seater fighters just go struggle to cover the distances involved. The Kraken has a relatively low crew complement of 10 considering its size. However, unlike capitals like the Idris or Javelin, most of the Kraken's power comes from the ships it can transport on its landing pads and its hangars, so you'll also have to factor in pilots and crew for any of these that you'd want to bring along. The Kraken also has a privateer variant. If the BMM is a floating bazaar, then the Kraken privateer is a floating shopping mall. The privateer aftermarket kit from Cousin Crows converts much of the Kraken's interior space into shops, including a sealed off area for conducting shady dealings behind closed doors. The Aegis Javelin is the largest ship available for players to pledge for. With a max crew of 80, this is the end game for a lot of larger organisations. It's not ready for players yet, obviously, uh, but if you want to see one in the wild, just check out the Xeno Threat event. Also, with a bit of luck, we'll get another chance to tour one at Invictus. The Destroyer has a wide array of weaponry, with two size 8 and 11 size 6 turrets, and a huge payload of size 12 torpedoes. You know, I hate to think how big those things are going to be. The ship has all the facilities on board to act as an org fortress base, including a medical bay, a mess hall, a brig, and a hangar big enough to house an Aegis Redeemer for boarding operations. It's also highly modular with six exchangeable component rooms. It would be really cool to see what CRG come up with here to allow us to tailor our flagship. One very interesting limitation of the Javelin that backers have been able to pledge for is that it will be a stripped back military surplus version that have reportedly seen hard service against the Vandal. They've had all the weapons and systems removed. As such, you won't be summoning it up on day one and heading out to wreck the verse with your org. You're gonna have to put significant work into restoring this beast to its former glory. However, I personally think this is a good limit on how much power certain orgs and players can wield on day one. It'll offer a challenge for orgs to work towards together. And as a final bonus, we have the F-8C Lightning from Anvil. This is the civilian version of the UE Navy's premier heavy fighter. It's not available to buy per se. You can technically get one in your hangar through cash pledge, uh, but I believe, don't quote me and feel free to correct me, CIG give you one if you break the $10,000 mark in terms of pledges. Alternatively, and the way I intend to get mine, is uh, it should be available to buy in-game once you've hit a certain point in Squadron 42. This fighter looks like it's going to be a total beast though. Eight guns under pilot control, with two size 4s and six size 3s, means it's likely to wreck. Add to that four size 1 shield generators and you have a seriously punchy package. Watch out for this one on the show floor of Invictus later this year. I hope they redo what they did at IAE and let us get in. 
Uh, it was great to be able to get myself in the cockpit, and I, uh, I might have sat there and made a few pew-pew noises to myself. So there we have it, I hope you enjoyed this roundup of the ship still in concept, and let me know down in the comments if there's anything you're looking forward to in particular, and just remember ships are a personal choice, you don't have to like what someone else does, uh, but that doesn't mean they're not allowed to. If you think I've earned it, then please hit the all important like and subscribe buttons, and consider sharing this video with a friend as that sort of thing massively helps the channel. If you'd like to go the extra mile in supporting us, there is also a Patreon link down below, but honestly, just watching and getting involved in the discussion is more than enough. So with all that said, thanks for tuning in, and I look forward to seeing you next time.